Hi again, Stan here. Welcome to chapter three of my travelogue, The Sussex Coast Road. In this episode, we are traveling further along the English Channel, from St. Leonard's to Bexhill. In these few miles, we find luxury purpose-built resort towns and many tales of old battles. Come on along and explore with me. Traveling a little way down the A259, west along the Hastings Seafront, without noticing it, we're in St. Leonard's. Full name is St. Leonard's on the Sea, and so the English Channel didn't give it away. Originally constructed as a separate beach resort for the wealthy in the 1820s, St. Leonard's and Hastings amalgamated in the late 19th century. A London property developer, James Burton, purchased the land which had been part of a farm. Unlike Hastings Cliffs, this land sloped down to the sea. He built a new town with villas, seafront houses, hotels, shops, services, parks, and a turnpike to get there. He also built an archway to mark the boundary with Hastings. The town quickly became very fashionable and attracted royalty, including the future queen, Princess Victoria, and her mother. Because it was so popular, it started expanding eastward along the seafront. Not to be outdone, Hastings started building west towards St. Leonard's. By the 1870s, there was three miles of built-up seafront with no vacant land between the two towns. In 1875, they merged to become the County Borough of Hastings. There's one building we could not help but notice right on the seafront, the Marine Court. Opened in 1937, the Art Deco Residential Commercial Complex resembled the recently launched RMS Queen Mary. When opened, the 14-story complex was the highest residential building in Britain. The ground floor contained retail shops, while above were apartments, restaurants, dance halls, and bars. It was the height of luxury at the time. It's now a listed building has been fully restored. Like most seaside resorts, St. Leonard's had a pier built, especially to rival the Hastings Pier. Opening in 1891, it proved very popular with a pavilion, a dance hall, and a skating rink. Unfortunately, World War II put pay to the pier. Commissioned by the Admiralty in 1939, it was cut in half because of the fears of a German invasion. In 1941, it was bombed, and in 1943, a gale damaged it even more. The remains were sold and demolished in the early 1950s. For the history buffs, a quick trip to the village of Battle may be of interest. It is only 10 miles up the road from Hastings. Here we can look out over the field in which William the Conqueror from Normandy defeated the English King Harold in the year 1066. This battle defined the next 950 years of world history. Battle Abbey was built by the Normans as penance for killing so many people in their conquering of England. The ruins are worth the time to explore. Not really a part of the coast tour, but an important bit of history close by. Back on the A259, on the road to Bexhill is a field where different festivals, circuses, and entertainments are held. This area is known as Glyne Gap, and it has a spooky reputation. On some days, the morning mists do not clear here until much later in the day, and it is unusually quiet. A couple of decades ago, a man walking to work early one morning is reported to have seen a ghostly army marching up the gap and disappearing into the fog. Many battles have been fought along this piece of coast. Roman soldiers marched here 2,000 years ago. Saxon King Olaf defeated the men of the Hastings tribe in 771. Vikings plagued the countryside for hundreds of years. The Battle of Hastings was fought not 10 miles away. The French raided the coast continually in the Middle Ages. Smuggling here was considered a career occupation. In World War II, this area was protected by tens of thousands of Canadian soldiers to keep the Germans from invading. On a direct route to London, many German bombs were dropped along this valley. Some things, whatever they are, do not like to leave. Now on to Bexhill, where we find another purpose-built beach resort town for the rich, built in the Victorian times. The history of the town actually goes back to the 8th century, when King Olaf built a church. Mostly destroyed during the Roman conquest, the area was given to one of William's faithful knights, 
They changed hands a few times, but in 1561, Queen Elizabeth I gave it to Thomas Sackville, whose descendants owned it for the next 400 years. One of the town's biggest claims to fame is that it's the site of England's first ever motor car races that were held here in 1902. One outstanding building that cannot be missed in Bexhill is the Deval War Pavilion. Opened in 1935, this modernistic public building contained a theater, restaurant, reading room, and lounge. The military took it over during World War II and it fell into disrepair. It finally became a listed building in 1986 and funds were found to return it to its former glory. As with many of these tourist towns built along the southeast coast, the town has a lovely row of carrot seaside houses built along the promenade for the wealthy of the time. Many of these have been converted to small hotels, B&Bs, and restaurants. Bexhill also has a lovely old town with very large Victorian homes and the ruins of the old manor house and gardens. There is a tale that the smells of home cooking that would come from these houses 150 years ago still fills the air with no visible source. Hungry visitors cannot find the restaurants that are serving these delicious smelling foods. Some things, whatever they are, do not want to leave. Follow the A259 from Bexhill Old Town west for a couple of miles and we leave the built up area and into the farmland. The road here is about a mile inland from the channel as we head to Pevensey Bay. That ends chapter three. Thanks for joining me exploring this part of the coast. Chapter four will be out soon. Press the subscribe button to be notified when that happens. As always, please press the like button and share this with your friends. See you next time. Bye for now.